So we're looking at the exhibition, The Impossible Ideal, Victorian Fashion and Femininity, and it draws on historic women's dresses from the Flemings collection. When we think of the Victorian era, we think of the amazing fashion, which you see on view here, but you also think about these ideals of womanhood uh, that were enforced. You know, a woman was the moral center of the family. She upheld purity and she, you know, mostly was supposed to stay at home, take care of her husband and her children, and really maintain and manage a perfect home. Wasn't really expected to go out into the world much other than maybe visiting her friends. So the fashion reflects that in terms of the restrictiveness of the movement through underwear like corsets and crinolines. But then towards the end of the era, you start to see that being questioned. You start to see more women going out into the world and that's reflected in the fashion as well. When we think of Victorian fashion, we think of really extreme silhouettes. So we think about the corset and the way that it pulls women's waists in. Um, maybe not to uh, as severe extremes as we imagine. The, the tight lacing was really only a small minority of women. But still, it pulled them in a few inches. You've got these big cage crinoline hoop skirts, like the Gone with the Wind era. These were really popular from the late 1850s to the mid 1860s, you know, that could take up a huge diameter, a huge amount of space. Um, after that, you have bustles, the big rear pads and, and train, long trains. None of these are very practical items. Um, you know, skirts that brush against the floor and, you know, make it hard to get around. They're going to get dirty. Um, so all of that, those elements of fashion are reflecting the fact that women aren't really expected to be out and about in the world too much. In the 1890s, you start to see that change. You see slimmer skirts, easier to walk around in. You see women's dresses that uh, borrow elements from men's suit styles. So women are going out into the world to advocate for suffrage or temperance or for the poor. For example, the editors of women's magazines were advocating for more women to be educated. They were doing so primarily so they would be good moral instructors and companions um, to their children and their husbands. And we know part of this is a myth. I mean, yes, that's largely true, particularly for wealthy white women, but we know that that's not the entire makeup of the womanhood of the United States. So there are working women of uh, many classes and colors who are um, doing what they need to to support their families, which could include working. There's a blue dress in the entrance to the exhibition. And this was worn by a woman who, for her graduation from the University of Vermont in 1878. So this is just a few years after UVM starts admitting women. It's an example of the increasing access to higher education that starts to happen in this era. Now, women who got a college education largely from more wealthy backgrounds. And also, they might work for a bit after they graduated, uh, often as teachers, as uh, Ellen Miller, the wearer of that dress, did. But once they got married, they usually stopped working. Um, so there was still that expectation that once you were a married woman, your primary role was as a wife. The Victorian era is also the birth of consumer culture a huge explosion due to the Industrial Revolution and advances in print techniques and distribution of, of magazines, publicly accessible. So women's magazines really emerge and play a big role in the era. And they play a big role in sort of telling women what their roles should be, what their fashion should be, what crafts they should be making in the home, how they should be educating their children, how they should be educating themselves. So they really wield a, a big influence at the time. Certainly by the 1890s, we start to see this change happening, um, where women are leaving the home more, uh, working more, or at, entering the public sphere to advocate for important causes, including education, suffrage. There's still a sense that the ideal is primarily a white and wealthy woman. Um, there's, we still don't see a greater visibility for more diverse definitions of what it means to be a woman. One way we tried to acknowledge that there were more diverse ways to be a woman in America in the exhibition is to have a collection of historic photographs represented in the entranceway of women of diverse backgrounds, women who worked on farms, women who were black, Native American, Latin American, to show that this ideal of womanhood as white and wealthy is, is not the only is not the only one. The era was so much more complicated than we often envision. So even as I 
explore some of the aspects of Victorian femininity that we kind of expect to see, the corsets, the gorgeous ball gowns, that kind of thing. I want to challenge people to realize that things were a bit more complicated than they seemed on the surface.